Welcome back to the Deep Six Wrestling Podcast. It is Thursday, August the 18th. I'm Pat. Uh, normally I would be joined by my co-host here, Joey, but unfortunately scheduling does not allow for that. So it's just me today covering AEW Dynamite from last night, which was the House of Dragon special, which is going to be a, a much talked about show in the coming days and weeks, uh, as we would see a uh, so, some big stuff going down between uh, the AEW World Champion Sam Punk and the interim AEW World Champion John Moxley, the return of Kenny Omega in the AEW Trios Tournament, uh, La Faction and Gobernable turning on Dragon Lee after the main event, um, the announcement of Tony Storm versus Thunder Rosa for All Out, Brian Danielson versus Daniel Garcia in a two out of three falls match, Daniel Garcia possibly leaving the Jericho Appreciation Society and joining the uh, Blackpool Combat Club. And, of course, now, as uh, I'm recording this, I was, I was holding off on recording as news started coming out, the the big news between uh, CM Punk and Hangman Page and AEW as a whole, uh, which we will get into a little bit later on, but, um, yeah, so lot, lots to talk about on, on this episode today of the podcast. Um, the G1 Finals were also this morning. I will not be talking about them in this episode. Uh, I might mention stuff at the end of the podcast, but we'll have a whole other review for the G1 sometime after this. So, um, if you're if you're looking for stuff on that, don't worry, we will have it covered. You can catch up with our past coverage. We have a bunch of reviews for the entire tournament out on our YouTube channel and on streaming services where we uh, are streaming as a podcast. So, if you want to listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, wherever you want, uh, you can find that. Just list it as the Deep Six Wrestling Podcast. So. Uh, yes, G1 coverage will be coming later, but for right now, AW Dynamite is what we're here to talk about. Uh, so, I guess it, it's it's so weird because I like normally I would want to just dive into the actual wrestling show to recap it, but I know that a lot of people probably want to hear about the CM Punk stuff. Um, so I, I I feel like with it being the big news. That's how we should probably kick this episode off, right? So, um, I believe, I think it was last night, um, after the show went off the air, we got the, uh, we got a report here from, uh, Dave Meltzer, uh, talking about, uh, CM Punk, and, uh, he brought up, so, so during Punk's opening promo, he would, uh, before he would address John Moxley, he would randomly bring up Adam Page, uh, and would call him out, uh, with the implication that, you know, if Page wanted his rematch, he should come take it right now, and we did not get Hangman Page coming out, and Punk then called him a coward. It felt very, you know, off the cuff, uh, and, you know, it uh it definitely made Punk seem more heel than than normal, but played off obviously the build to their match for Double or Nothing. But speaking on the Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Meltzer noted, if you're wondering about CM Punk uh, at the start of the show with Adam Page, it was weird uh, for everyone, as in nobody knew he was going to do that. If you remember months ago when they were feuding and they said there's a lot of reality to it, well, there's a lot of reality to it. I don't know what the deal was, and nobody else does either. Uh, Punk was supposed to go out there and talk about Moxley and build the match, and he did, but it was after he talked about Adam Page. So, uh, that was our first part about this, <clears throat> and um, uh, Brian Alvarez would continue saying, uh, well, I should mention also, since a lot of people have read the wrong thing into that, whatever they're going to do next week with the title match, I saw a lot of people saying, oh, you know, it's probably going to be Punk and Hangman at All Out because of Punk's promo beginning at the show. Punk's promo had absolutely zero to do with whatever they're going to do at the pay-per-view, so don't read into that. Uh, maybe they're going to do this or that, but it was not supposed to happen. Uh, Punk went into business for himself and then moved on. Uh, and he says, which was bullshit actually, because he called the guy out and it was off script, so of course Hangman's not going to come out, and then Punk calls him a coward. Uh, like what? So, that's our first bit here. And then... Just a few minutes ago here, uh, we got the report from Sean Ross Sapp as he would bring out this, uh, he would tweet out saying, 
One source familiar with the situation said they believed there was a chance of CM Punk uh, not showing up at last night's episode of Dynamite. And the full report here from Fightful Select says, Sources familiar with the situation claim that CM Punk has often verbally expressed his displeasure, including recently so blatantly that they thought he might end up uh, quitting the company. Those close to him said that he might have almost decided to stay home instead of coming to the August 17th episode of Dynamite, but don't think he would have quit. We haven't been given any indication that he plans on leaving AEW, but one veteran said that they have heard of threats being levied. So, yeah. Um, interesting stuff there. Uh, it's a, a lot going on. Uh, we also have from uh, Voices of Wrestling, um, as they would mention, um, we they, they could not confirm Dave's report that Punk went into business for himself because he hasn't. Uh, they haven't been outright told that. However, they believe it's entirely possible. Confirmed that there is heat between uh, Punk and Hangman that dates back to uh, Hangman Page's promo about workers' rights during their their build up to their Double or Nothing match. Uh, there was apparently a blow up following Hangman's promo that led to, led to a closed door meeting with Tony Khan. Punk was caught off guard by some of the points Hangman was making, and he felt he went into business for himself. Uh, Punk had apparently told people he would never job for Hangman Page, um, but they noted that they're not sure if he said it to Hangman's face, but wouldn't be surprised if he did. Uh, they went on to talk about how there are more feuds in AEW that are based off reality than we may think, and that there is legitimate tension between a lot of the AEW originals and ex-WWE stars that have come in. Um, they don't know if Punk still feels that he wouldn't job to Page since this was said months ago, but he uh, he believes Punk did a great job building to the match with Page regardless of if either guy went into business for himself. Um, note that Hangman was technically the one who started this with a notoriously fiery Punk. Uh, that Colt Cabana being banished to the ROH uh, being banished to ROH has pissed off most of the locker room. Uh, the Voices of Wrestling does not believe it's a work because they would be working every single person in the locker room. And if that's a work, they are working everybody, including the locker room. Locker room. Um, but you can never discount a work. Uh, and that's not me playing both sides or anything like that. You just can't in pro wrestling. Especially when they're doing this elaborate MJF storyline where everybody is being worked. So, again, uh, lots. <laughs> lots to unpack. Lots going on. I... I like it's it's really strange I don't have like I can't really make an opinion on this just because we, we really don't know the behind the scenes stuff here um, it's just <laughs> it's so strange because like if you if so let's say we're going with CM Punk is is really pissed off and and is trying to ruin hangman here and make him look bad because he he brought up workers' rights and, and uh, hinted towards issues with Colt Cabana and CM Punk during their program. CM Punk isn't one who's, like, not afraid of going for, for low shots or low blows in promos. Um, so it does feel a bit weird that you would, you know, get to the point where you're possibly going to walk out of another wrestling company over somebody bringing up issues like that. Um... I'm sure this is going to lead to some polarizing discussions online between people clowning AEW for bringing in CM Punk, for people clowning CM Punk for being um, petty, for uh, people clowning Hangman Page for starting this. Um, but regardless, we did find out at the end of the show that in, in, the implication was that we were going to most likely be getting John Moxley versus CM Punk at All Out. The opening of the show made it seem that way. They kept talking about the pay-per-view. But right before the main event went on, we got the announcement that instead, next week on AEW Dynamite, we are going to be getting CM Punk versus John Moxley in the unification match for the AEW World Championship. With that being said, with how this show was structured, with, with Punk opening the show with him very clearly playing the heel between the role of, of him and Moxley, 
Um, we had, and we'll get to it when we talk about it. But you had CM Punk, you know, bringing up stuff about uh, he was he brought up co- uh, his history with Eddie Kingston. He he was making uh, he he was saying that Moxley's not as good as John Cena. He's the worst member of the Shield. He's the worst member of the Blackpool Combat Club. Um, was was saying that uh, Eddie Kingston's only the the second best Kingston he's worked with, uh, referencing Kofi Kingston. Um, he was belittling John Moxley. He was taunting him with the Snow Angels in the ring. He was calling out Hangman Page here and calling him a coward. It felt very, very much so like we were indicating that we were getting a CM Punk heel turn, uh, if not right before our very eyes. So. Next week, our main event of Dynamite, we have it already. This is one of the biggest matches you could do um, on on Dynamite, uh, since, again, this was most likely what many people assumed was going to be your main event of the pay-per-view in Chicago. You have all of this added drama now with these reports coming out for uh, CM Punk looking unfavorable. Uh, Hangman Page is now thrown into the mix here he had nothing seemingly scheduled for all out which felt very strange and now his name is brought up into the AEW world title scene once again we have the looming shadow of mjf with a lot of people having assumed that he would return at all out uh to most likely challenge or attack cm punk um so regardless of what's going on and if this is bad it's bad like if cm punk is actually on the verge of walking out of AEW, that's not good. Um, And the fact that we could see that next week, theoretically, we could just have... If things have gotten to the point where he's done, we could have Punk just agreeing to do one match, Moxley beats him, and then Punk walks out, and he's done. And that's weird. Uh, It's it's wild, it's weird, and I I don't think many people want that. I think what a lot of people do want is, if you're going to turn this into reality and you're gonna like if you bring reality into the show you would turn punk heel and based off the reaction that we saw from mjf's last appearance at the the uh, la show and when cm punk came out while it wasn't on air and 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 tried to talk to him you know the implication would be that you could probably do a wild wild move where you have heel CM Punk versus babyface MJF as your top program on AEW moving forward. Um, But there's a lot of moving parts here. We still don't know what the deal is with MJF. There's no confirmation on if he's with the company. I mean, he's with the company. There's no confirmation on if he's coming back or when he's coming back. We have no idea what's really going on with CM Punk here. Um, Moxley is on another run of his career just delivering some of the, the best matches he's had. Um, while, you know, carrying this interim world title with crazy amounts of pride. I, um, like, it's just so, it's so interesting. Because, like, I, I don't know. It, it's it's going to be interesting to see. But regardless, with all of this added on to it, with, with the, the already heated program with Moxley and Punk, with the looming shadow of MJF, with Hangman now added into this, with the drama... All of this makes Dynamite next week, like, the must-watch show for wrestling. So if this is a plan, and this is, like, them, you know, leaking stuff to dirt sheets and and, and just trying to build this up to try and get hype, if it works, it works. So we'll see, but it's genuinely one of the most interesting things I think we've had happen in quite some time. And it's going to be polarizing for a lot of people, so... We'll see how it goes, but that's that's the big thing coming out of AEW Dynamite, aside from the Kenny Omega return, um, and I just wanted to talk about it before the show rather than, you know, going through Dynamite and then talking about it at the end. I feel like a lot of people probably just want to hear about the CM Punk situation uh, and, and people's thoughts on it, and and yeah, I don't know. I Like, this time next week, CM Punk could not be with AEW. He could be the top heel in the company. MJF could be back, Uh, Moxley could be world champion, Hangman could be involved. There's so many moving factors here that, like, I'm not a wrestling insider, I don't know, but it it has me captivated. Like, I'm glued in after an electric episode of Dynamite yesterday. 
we have what looks to be one of the most interesting episodes of the entire show uh, in their three-year history next week. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, and just to break this up, uh, so this will serve as the intro to the podcast, um, Kenny Omega did cut a promo off-air uh, from, from Dynamite that I feel like a lot of people might be interested in listening to, so... Uh, serving as a little intermission between this and the actual review portion of Dynamite, I'll, uh, I'll toss in the audio of the promo from Kenny Omega. So sit back, relax, and listen to the cleaner talk about his return to the ring on AEW Dynamite. Now, for some of you, this may very well be your first live AEW show. If this is your second time, I very much appreciate you because if memory serves me correctly, last time we were here for a Halloween spectacle. Where we saw the elite against Jack Evans on Helico and um, he was he was here before. He's, he's, I swear, he could literally be in the crowd right now, in the, fir- in the front row, with a box on his head, and I wouldn't be able to recognize the guy. Long story short, it's always a pleasure to be performing in front of you fellows. And I thought, hey, with a main, main, uh, with a rare main event slot tonight, I might as well take the microphone and say a couple words to you guys because I've been gone for quite some time. And if I do it in this format, I don't have to worry about how much time I take. I don't have to worry about how tired or hurt I am. I can just speak to you guys like a normal human being because really, that's all I am. So for the past seven, eight, nine months, or whatever it's been, it's been pretty grueling. Many times I question myself, am I really gonna be able to come back to AEW and perform at the level of these professional wrestlers? And certainly, it's gonna take me a while to catch up to these guys. It might be a while, before I'm able to challenge for a singles title again. But this very much is a work in progress, and I'm very glad that all of you are joining me on this journey. Don't get it confused, however. I'm not a good guy. I might even cheat to win every now and then. But one thing that I will say is when we're in this ring, you're getting a genuine Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, and elite performance from the genuine Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. We're not pretending to be somebody that we're not. We're not a tribute act. We're not a parody. We're not selfish, and we're not in this for selfish means and for selfish gains. We are here to leave a legacy, and that legacy isn't titles. It's not even match ratings. It's not even how much money we make for our families and ourselves. It is changing the world via changing wrestling world and the way that you guys consume it. So maybe, heck, you don't like six-man tags. That's fine, because we're gonna give you guys the greatest singles matches. We're gonna give you guys the greatest hardcore matches Mixed matches, women's matches, all different kinds of matches. It's going to be a smorgasbord of wrestling. That was always the mission statement. And as long as the elite are here, you will make sure, we will make sure that you guys get that variety every time we perform. Win, lose, or draw, you're gonna get our greatest effort. Win, lose, or draw, taping. Athletic tape, medical devices or not, you're gonna get Kenny Omega too.
somehow. Somehow by a stroke of luck, and because these guys are better than you even know that they are, they're incredible. We were able to survive tonight. We're alive in this tournament. Let's not all of a sudden start cheering us. You guys booed us for like a year. He's got a point. And maybe I should be mad too. Maybe I should be mad too because the reason why I'm in this state right now, the reason why I have to have three, sometimes four sessions of physical rehab every single day is because of you. Maybe I should hate each and every one of you because I come back out here for you guys. It's never for me. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna be a little strange. I don't get out much, so I, be I became a strange individual. I'm gonna liken you fans to a very mischievous cat that pees and poops all over the house. Boy, do I get mad when I find it. Boy, do I get mad because I have to clean it. But heck, how can I hate a little kitty cat? So on TV, I may blame you guys. I may hold resentment towards you guys, but perhaps deep down inside, as long as this never gets aired, <laughs> I do very much appreciate you. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's get into the actual AW Dynamite show. Uh, I have been really, really good about taking notes these past couple of weeks for basically all wrestling shows that I'm watching. But for some reason, I completely, completely forgot to take notes last night um, during the show. Um, so uh, I'm referring to, just for full transparency, I'm re re referring to the uh, write-up from Cage Side Seats so I can, uh, you know, recap this show. Um, but you'll get my thoughts on everything but I just need a guide here to go over the entire show. So, uh, kicking things off, we would have uh, CM Punk making his entrance uh, as he would come out here and, as we mentioned earlier in this episode, would cut this promo uh, and, and would start off by calling out Hangman Page, uh, sitting down cross-legged in the ring and uh, saying that if he, he wants his rematch, then he's got it right now. Hangman doesn't come out and he says that it's not cowboy shit, it's coward shit. And the apology from Hangman must be at least as loud as the disrespect. Um, so, you know, <laughs> we'll see how this goes and if they ever are able to follow up on this. Um, but uh, Punk says that if anybody else wants to com um, come down, uh, you know, then, then come on out. Uh, and he goes on to uh, then head towards John Moxley here. As he says that Moxley has a lot of fans, and he can be number one in your heart, but he's not number one in this ring. And CM Punk is the AE World, uh, AEW World Champion, not the interim AEW World Champion. And he knows what it's like to talk a big game and claim to be the best. And he knows what it's like to lose, but Moxley has always been number two. Um, there's always been a guy that's had his number, and Punk is that guy. He says that John Moxley is the third best guy in his own group, referring to the Blackpool Combat Club, and says that seems to be a recurring theme in his career, um, referring to obviously the Shield, which got a big reaction here. Uh, he calls Eddie Kingston out as well, saying that he's the third best Eddie he's worked with and the second best Kingston that he's ever been in a locker with room, or locker room with, uh, referring to Eddie Guerrero as the first Eddie. No idea who the second one would be, and then obviously Kofi Kingston. So, we'll see. Um, CM Punk then asks the crowd to tell him when he's telling lies. And he, he says that he's missed the audience. And he's missed defending the title. And he's ready, ready to do it again at, uh, against John Moxley at All Out in Chicago. And he says that John Moxley isn't even the first John he's going to beat in Chicago. As Moxley makes his entrance. Punk says that he's got time as Moxley makes his entrance to the crowd. And proceeds to do snow angels in the ring. Uh, just disrespecting Moxley here. As uh, 
Mox gets into the ring and gets on the mic. He says to watch out, Punk's dropping pipe bombs. Uh, writing checks with his mouth that his body can't cash it as he then hobbles on one foot. And he questions Punk for thinking he's the best wrestler in the world uh, because most of the time he's not even the best wrestler in catering. CM Punk thinks the microphone in his hand is power, but this is the real world, and the words he spits into the mic don't mean shit, and neither does the belt on his shoulder. And to be fair, his own uh, belt doesn't matter, as he throws down the interim AEW World Championship and says none of this matters until he beats Punk. He is the heart and soul of this company, and every time he gets called the interim champ, it weighs on him. Punk says that he can be the heart and soul. That's fine. Punk is the dollars and cents, and John says that they both know the only reason he came to AEW is because Punk ran out of money, and uh, being the best is about having guts and fighting spirit, and everybody knows that Punk has ran out of fighting spirit a long time ago. Uh, and Moxley, you know, baits him and, and says to prove it, prove him wrong, but he knows Punk's not going to do shit. CM Punk says that they, uh, they have a match at the pay-per-view, and he's afraid if he touches him right now, he's just going to bleed all over him. We, they go forehead to forehead here, and then we start shoving, as then the two of them just unload on punches on each other before the uh, security has to come down, and we had a, a big brawl here. Uh, so a very hot start to the show. Um, regardless of whatever comes out of the CM Punk situation with AEW and with Hangman Page, this was an incredibly, incredibly engaging promo battle between these two. Um, two of the best on the mic, two of the top stars in AEW. Moxley is on. Mo Moxley stole what was supposed to be the summer of Punk and turned it into the summer of Moxley with his interim AEW championship defenses, and basically becoming the champion um, with a number of just wonderful matches from defenses against the likes of Mance Warner. Um, Brody King, Chris Jericho, uh, his non-title match with uh, Takeshita. Uh, so, like, it's hard to deny that Moxley has been a shining star on AEW throughout the summer. Um, and obviously taking Punk's spot against Tanahashi at Forbidden Door. So, um, yeah, I thought this was an incredibly great opening. It, it hints at a CM Punk heel turn, it sh which is something that everybody has wanted. Because as good as Punk can be as a babyface, it's widely regarded that, you know, CM Punk is one of the, the best of all time when it comes to heel work. And John Moxley has become an incredible, incredible, engaging, blurring the lines figure here where sometimes he's heel, sometimes he's babyface. He's somewhere in the middle. You know, alignment doesn't really matter to him. Like, he has morals, but at the same time, he, he's not afraid to beat up his own friends. So, I thought this was an amazing opening to the show. Um... A, tr a true a true highlight for for promo work in AEW. Uh, we get Powerhouse Hobbs getting interviewed backstage, saying that um, Ricky Starks showed his the world his true colors, um, saying that Starks is okay with losing, and for two years he's paraded around like he's God's gift to this business and hid behind Powerhouse Hobbs so he'd stay FTW champion, but he couldn't do it anymore. Hobbs doesn't just break backs. He breaks next, and he's got something for QT and the Factory, too. Uh, we would not get a follow-up on this, so I'm assuming something on Rampage or Dynamite next week for Hobbs and the Factory. Uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat is our guest timekeeper for uh, the 2 out of 3 Falls match and the main event. So uh, we go to Brian Danielson versus Daniel Garcia in a 2 out of 3 Falls match. Um, I'm not going to go through and recap this entire match. I will say... That these two have incredible chemistry uh, coming off of a... And, like, it's so interesting because we saw the main event that they had a few weeks ago when Brian first made his return from injury. Fantastic main event. Uh, it kicked off a string of awesome main events for AEW. Uh, with that, followed up the week after with Wheeler Yuta versus Chris Jericho. Followed up with that with John Moxley versus Chris Jericho. Followed up with that this week with La Faction and Gobernable versus the returning Elite. Um, so, and next week we're getting Punk versus Moxley for the, the, to crown the undisputed champion. So, um, yeah, lots of, lots of exciting main events in AEW right now, but comparing their first match, um, that they had, uh, I guess three weeks ago now, like this was a totally different match. Same guys, completely different style of match and completely different match um and obviously it has to be because you know you're working with the two out of three fall stipulation but like s still it was really just you know cool to see these two guys who are obviously very technical um 
a, a, a very similar in their, their wrestling styles to some degree, be able to completely change the way that, like, you know, this match fell um, compared to their first one. So I thought that was definitely worth noting. And in terms of the actual, like, match, I thought this was awesome. I think it was definitely hurt by the fact that we, um, just, like, the commercial breaks, because we opened the show, and obviously we, you know, we didn't have any commercials for the, for the opening uh, promo and everything, but it's just, you know, that's, that's how TV is. If you're going to do a, a long opening, we saw it before with... Um, the MJF and CM Punk, uh, like, 20-minute promo, or, uh, yeah, it was them who had that last fall, I think it was in, like, November, where they opened the show for a pretty rare, like, opening, pro like, uh, like extended promo segment from AEW, um, and then, you know, you don't have a commercial for that first, like, 15, 20 minutes, you're not gonna go to picture-in-picture picture during that, so you have to make up for it elsewhere, so, unfortunately, Garcia and Danielson got hit with, a, 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 I think, like, two or three commercial breaks. Um, I think two of them were picture-in-picture. Picture. I know one of them, at least, was not, at least for the, the TBS app feed. Um, we had just an actual commercial break. Um, so that definitely hurt the pacing, which is why, if you have access to the AEW Plus feed, whether through Fight or through other means... I highly recommend checking it out just because watching AEW Dynamite with no commercials is uh, honestly a treat. Uh, when I get the chance to, I always try to, and it, it's it's so much better than watching just with the commercials, with the picture-in-picture. Picture. Um, so, yeah. But um, I thought these two had an awesome match here. Some really great stuff across the board. Um, and just, you know, these two going back and forth with you know, technical and, and just hard-hitting style stuff here. The one downside to this, aside from the, the commercial breaks, was commentary uh, with Chris Jericho and Jim Ross together. Uh, and and Chris Jericho's just repeatedly, anytime he referred to Daniel Garcia, he was just screaming, Danny Garcia, that's my boy Danny Garcia, uh, which did get to be a bit much by the end of this. But um, I thought this was a really good match from, from top to bottom. Um, and we would get Garcia winning the first fall by ref stoppage. Um, Danielson would get the second one, uh, with a, with a, like a, a flash pin. Uh, and then it would come down to Danielson winning, uh, the match with the label lock as Garcia would, um, just fade here. And I thought this was, the, the finish was done so well because as these two are like recovering from this brutal matchup that they had that just went for I don't even know the actual time on this but it felt like it was a while Garcia's just like still trying to go he doesn't realize he's lost and it's just like you see it come over him that he, that he failed to beat Danielson again and and Danielson like offers his hand and Garcia gets to his feet and it looks like he's going to accept the handshake but commentary notes that Jericho has left the, the commentary table and he blindsides Danielson in the ring and starts beating on him. And it looks like Garcia's, like, you don't know if he's going to join in on the beatdown or if he's going to pull Jericho off. And he does. He pulls Y2J off of Danielson. And we get a stare down between Garcia and, uh, and, and Danielson. Or, sorry, uh, between Garcia and Jericho. And uh, Garcia ends up slapping Jericho's hand away from him. So it does appear that, you know on the surface, that we could be seeing our first defection from uh, from Jericho Appreciation Society with Garcia ending up in the Blackpool Combat Club. You know, something that I think a lot of people wanted when we first saw the group. And for what it's worth, Garcia has done some amazing work with the JAS. He, he's found himself as a character that has become a really good promo. Um, so I think his time with Jericho has 100% helped. But in terms of style, I think obviously him joining the Blackpool Combat Club makes a lot of sense. So, uh, but very exciting stuff. I would go out of your way to watch this match. And if you can, find a version that does not have the picture-in-picture -picture breaks because uh, you'd be doing yourself a disservice by uh, just, you know, watching it with commercials. <laughs> um, we go backstage for a little interview with Swerve in Our Glory and Private Party. Uh, Strickland says that they uh, should be thankful and Private Party question him 
uh, for what exactly, and he says that this is as close as they're ever going to get to the tag titles. And after their match on Rampage, they can walk their happy asses back down the ladder. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to see this. Uh, I actually like Private Party quite a bit, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fairly excited that they're getting a tag title shot. Uh, it should be a good time. Tony Nice was not advertised for the show, and we go to make him making his entrance, and we we would never find out who he was supposed to be facing. So, uh, but as he's making his entrance, Moxley runs out and attacks Tony Nice and, and Mark Starling. As he uh, then comes into the ring and calls out CM Punk, he says he's sick of waiting, and if Punk wants to unify the belts, let's get it over with. Punk comes down, getting chased by staff, uh, who try to, you know, hold him back, and we get another pull-apart brawl here as Claudio comes out and Wheeler Yuta comes out, and uh, they have to, Yuta and uh, Claudio have to escort Moxley out through the crowd to break this up, so I did appreciate this, you know, so we opened the show with this, and then as we headed into Hour 2, we would get this this second thing here with these guys. Um, yeah, I just thought it was a nice follow-up, and it made it feel unscripted. It made it feel more realistic, which, you know, again, referring back to the, the Hangman and Punk stuff, it does seem, and like even the MJF stuff, it seems like this is something that AEW really likes to kind of blur the lines on. Uh, 2.0 and Chris Jericho are backstage, and Jericho says that next week he's going to give Daniel Garcia, or he wants to, to meet Daniel Garcia in the ring, and he's going to have a face-to-face where he wants to see what where his loyalty lies. Uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat then rolls in, uh, showing up, and he says that he's been watching Garcia, and he doesn't need Jericho, uh, who's the same guy he was 15 years ago, and Danielson would be the better choice to mentor Garcia. Jericho tells him to uh, keep his hands off of him, uh, keep, keep his hands off of him and stay out of his business as he walks off, and Angelo Parker tries to get physical with Steamboat, uh, as he, he grabs him, and Ricky Steamboat just slaps Angelo Parker. Lovely stuff. The Ass Boys come out. Austin and Colton Gunn versus the Varsity Blondes. And the Colt 45 basically gets hit immediately from Colton Gunn on Griff Garrison. And they win. <laughs> this is the definition of a squash match. Uh, afterwards, Billy gets on the mic and says that's what he's been trying to teach them. And he's super proud of them after this week. And uh, the proudest part of his career is going to be able to work next to them as Stokely Hathaway appears on the stage. And Billy is hugging with his kids, and as he sees Stokely, he breaks it. And we get the turn. The Gun Club turns on Billy and beat him down, choking him out in the ring as the Acclaim's music hits. And Anthony Bowens and Max Caster run the ass boys off here as we get the reunion that fans have been waiting for. Anthony Do- uh, Anthony Bowens puts the fingers out and asks Daddy Ass to scissor him, and he does. And you got to give the people what they want. We get Daddy Ass scissoring with the acclaimed for a phenomenal moment here. Um, so it does appear that Austin and Colton Gunn are joining the stable uh, that Stokely Hathaway is putting together with Ethan Page, Lee Moriarty, and now them. Um, very interested to see where that goes exactly. Uh, and if it will be an AW thing or an ROH thing, who knows? But I do appreciate, I do appreciate that they decided to reunite uh, Billy Gunn and the Acclaim because the chemistry between the three of them is just too good to not do. Um, so very excited for that. And then we would get a uh, a little uh, promo here from Satnam, Jay Lethal, and Sanjay Dutt, who has become unhinged as they uh, challenge FTR and Wardlow to a match it all out. Uh, so yeah, uh, then we get a promo from Death Triangle calling out United Empire out, and Pac says that he uh, says Will Osprey likes to parade himself around as the best Britain has produced, but he begs to differ, and he's very much looking uh, forward to next week, where him and his brothers, uh, the Lucha Brothers, are going to be beside him, and they're going to be the unstoppable unit built for this trios tournament. I am looking forward to that match so much. <laughs> Um, that, that looks like that's going to be an absolute, just insane match between United Empire and Death Triangle. Um, up next, Jungle Boy Jack Perry comes out, and he says that when he wore his Christian is a pussy shirt, he got in trouble and was asked to never wear it again, but, uh, boy oh boy, did that shirt nail things on the head. 
For weeks now, he's tried to hit Christian Cage with his hands, with a chair, and even a car, and Christian has done absolutely nothing. And uh, personally, he would never take that kind of treatment, but that's just him. So we can either chase Christian as long as he uh, has to, until he gets his hands at him, or Christian can man up and face him it all out. And Christian comes out and says no to the challenge, but not for the reason we think. He says things have gotten out of hand. Luchasaurus got himself suspended last week, and at the end of the day, he's actually proud of Jungle Boy. He's out here with all this confidence speaking for himself when a year ago he was like West Virginia and couldn't string a sentence together. He's been thinking, and obviously frustration boiled over when they lost the tag titles, and they both did and said things that neither of them really meant, and he understands and says that Jungle Boy made it personal, but it's okay. <laughs> that was honestly a very underrated line here. Um, and Christian says he doesn't want to fight. He wants to fix this and go on another ring, uh, run, and this time take Jungle Boy to the promised land. And he says at the end of the day, he's like a son to him. And he asks Jungle Boy to come home, offering him the hug as Jungle Boy pauses before tackling him. And uh, we just get a, a beat down here. And uh, Christian Cage just uh, gets like sent headfirst into the steel steps as we go to commercial break. Um, Jungle Boy definitely struggled here with this promo, um, compared to, you know, some of his other ones he's cut recently. This was a bit of a struggle. He did, just like, the cadence that he was speaking with, I think, is what did it. He was pausing a lot, and it let some people get some what chance in, which definitely hurt it. As soon as Christian came out, this became much better. Um, Christian is on fire right now. This man is f fantastic on the mic, and is the perfect shithead heel right now. Um, I am looking forward to this match. I still think, in my mind, Christian should win the first one, uh, and Jungle Boy should have to... Like, if you do this match at all out, Christian wins the first time, and then do a follow-up at, you know, Arthur Ashe or, or Full Gear, and Jungle Boy wins there. But I, I feel like Christian should probably win the first one, personally. Uh, FTR and Wardlow are backstage, and they refer to themselves as the Pinnacle, uh, and they... Uh, Wardlow says that it doesn't matter how big Satnam Singh is, everybody gets powerbombed. And Dax Harwood notes that Jay Lethal might have once been the best in the world, but right now he is. And uh, we're going to get Dax Harwood versus Jay Lethal in a singles match next week on Dynamite, which I am very excited for. I think both guys have had phenomenal 2022s from an in-ring perspective. Basically, any time they've been in the ring, it's been awesome um, for singles matches, tag matches, whatever. So I'm excited to see these two go one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and it should be a good time. Uh, we get Kylan King versus Tony Storm next, which was Kylan King's return to AEW for, I believe, the first time since the like late 2021 on Dark. But obviously, Kylan King is somebody who um, you know made a name for herself during the No Crowd Pandemic show. She was always in the crowd. She was working on Dark. Um, she then went to NWA uh, while still occasionally appearing on Dark. So nice to see her back. Um, she also got her own Titantron. She had entrance music. She had her own entrance when typically, you know, seeing this match i would have assumed that it would just be tony getting an entrance but uh no so it was nice to see um also she's so tall she's literally she's like i think they said she's six foot so um definitely it kind of King is a good look um I, I definitely like to see more of her whether it's in ring of honor or AEW. i thought she did really good in this match too playing the like you know the taller bigger powerhouse uh, that tony would have to take down um, and I thought this was a, a pretty solid match that these two had. It wasn't anything like, you know, it wasn't like best match of the night or anything, but I thought for reintroducing Kylan King to, like, the AEW audience and for her first match in AEW in quite some time, that, you know, it worked. It did what it needed to. Um, it wasn't just like a squash where Tony run, like, ran through her or anything. Perfectly reasonable. So, I enjoyed this a lot, and... I, I just continue to enjoy Tony Storm. I think she's having an awesome run in AEW. Um, I think anytime she's in the ring, she delivers pretty much. Uh, whether it's on Dynamite, Rampage, Dark, or Dark Elevation, I, I really don't think she's had an actual like bad match. I think the worst one she had was the, the one singles match against Britt. But yeah, I, I really like Tony Storm in AEW. I think she's a very good fit. And I think we're looking at our next AEW Women's World Champion as after this match it would be made official that she is going to be facing to uh, Thunder Rosa at All Out. And we would see Thunder Rosa backstage very, like, sarcastically, nonchalantly, like, slow clapping for Tony, who's supposed to be her friend. Um, so my assumption is that Thunder Rosa turns heel whether, you know, she cheats to win and beats Tony or if uh, Tony wins and then Rosa turns heel. But 
I think that's the right direction. Uh, we then got like a video package with uh, some some promos from the Trustbusters and Best Friends. Oh, excuse me, and the Best Friends uh, setting up their trios tournament match for Rampage, and obviously Sunny Kiss would be with the Trustbusters following Rampage, where uh, she turned heel. So, and yeah, so we would get our announcements for um, Rampage and Dynamite. Where let me try and get the full card up. Uh, so Rampage, uh, Swerve in Our Glory defend the AEW World Tag Team Championship against Private Party. Hook defends the FTW Championship against the Reality Zach Clayton. Um, as the, apparently there's going to be a weekly or bi-weekly thing, or just you know I guess semi-regular thing where Hook's going to be doing open challenges, which is definitely the right choice. Uh, Penelope Ford versus Athena. I'm actually looking forward to that one. Uh, we're going to hear from Claudio Castagnoli, the ROH World Champion. And in the uh, AW World Trios Championship Tournament, the Trustbusters versus the Best Friends. Dynamite next week. Chris Jericho uh, and Daniel Garcia's face to face. Dax Harwood versus Jay Lethal. The AW World Trios Tournament continues with Death Triangle versus Will Ospreay and Aussie Open. And John Moxley versus CM Punk for the AW World Championship. And, uh,. Yeah, so, um, already looking like a pretty big episode next week. Um, it's 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 very interesting. I, I like I, again. I still really don't know where we're gonna end up with Hangman and and Punk and MJF and Moxley or just Punk and Moxley or whoever's getting involved. But, but we're gonna see. Um, in an update. Uh, to the CM Punk thing, I guess I should note here that Brian Alvarez put out something uh, saying that there were a few people furious at CM Punk backstage because Hangman is a well-liked guy, um, so people are mad at Punk. You also have people who are on Punk's side uh, saying that Hangman started this, so they're mad that you're mad at CM Punk, uh, saying that I know this is pro wrestling and we have the MJF deal, but I was told that this is not a work. And it was started when Hangman was unprofessional, and Punk followed that up by making Hangman look like a fool. Um, so, this is, you know, uh, I guess we're going to see how this how this plays out. If they can manage to turn this into something, you, you could have genuinely, like, a, you, like, we already had Blood and Guts this year, but you could very, very well, like, turn this into something major with, like, Hangman reuniting with like the Bucks and Omega against Punk, FTR, and I, I guess Wardlow. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. That's again like fantasy booking. I don't think we would be heading that direction, but I have no idea. Um, or again, Punk and his team versus MJF, and possibly again, people have speculated that the Stokely Hathaway faction is going to be revealed to be being built by MJF. That could be the case. They're all non, um, like, WWE guys. So, we'll see. But it's very interesting, regardless. Um, and then we'd head to our main event. As we would get the uh, La Faction and Go Bernabe coming out. So, Andrade, Dragon Lee, and Roosh. Um, with Dragon Lee making his AEW debut. Obviously, he did wrestle at uh, Death Before Dishonor against Roosh. But making his Dynamite debut here taking on the Young Bucks as they would come out with Brandon Cutler and they would hand Justin Roberts piece of paper and the prelude music would hit as the crowd would start to come to life here with Justin Roberts doing a major introduction as Kenny Omega would make his grand return to AEW TV uh, the first time since losing the AEW World Championship to Hangman Page last year at Full Gear Massive reaction in just one of the best moments on Dynamite in forever. As Kenny Omega makes his return, coming out with Don Callis and Michael Nakazawa as Don Callis would join commentary. And this was just, this felt so good. It was very emotional to see Omega back. Um, and I thought this this man just proved why he's the best in the world uh, when he got into the ring. And throughout this match, you had this whole story... Something we've never really seen before of, you know, somebody like somebody who's regarded as like the guy in wrestling, arguably the best wrestler in the world, one of the best to ever do it, Kenny Omega, and 
the best battle machine, you know, um, coming back. And instead of just coming out and firing guns ablazing, we get this story of him not being 100%, of him having to work back up, him being rusty, him at le- him like when he's going for a suicide dive, his leg gives out and he has to restart. Uh, he can't do the one-winged angel properly. Uh, there's There's moments where he's out of breath. And we have him obviously wearing a compression shirt. He has an arm brace on. We're seeing a different side of Kenny Omega than we've ever seen before. And it's just, it, it, it's captivating. And like, uh, referring back to the promo that I put into the podcast earlier on, you heard Kenny talk. He, he has maintained this for years, that he wants to change the world. Um, he wants to change the wrestling world and the way people watch wrestling. And storyline-wise, you've seen it. You've seen it with him and the Kota Ibushi saga in New Japan and, and across other promotions. You saw it with the Hangman Page stuff with the Elite, uh, with a two plus year build in AEW, um, the likes of like long term storytelling and, and subtleness um, that we haven't seen really in mainstream wrestling in I don't even know how long. And it's built up not just on uh, Dynamite, but across Rampage and being the elite and social media. And it's just, you know, it, it, it's taking wrestling into a new way. Everything that you like requiring i don't even want to say requiring because you don't have to watch being the elite to understand what kenny omega is or what the hangman page feud was you can watch dynamite and it's still a compelling like program but if you watch something else it's adding to it you're getting more out of it it's like if you're in a compared to you know like an mcu movie like if you're if you're watching that if you're watching an mcu movie like a marvel movie if you're watching the avengers you can watch it you can be perfectly entertained you're going to get a cohesive story and you're going to know what's going on you're going to be satisfied but if you're doing extra work if, if you're reading comics and then you're seeing references to stuff that happened in the comics you're getting more out of it it's just like it's taking things and building building things up more and adding more layers to it more depth more storytelling um and more stuff for the hardcore fans that are you know wanting to put all of their energy into this like if you're a hardcore wrestling fan and, and like wrestling is like the thing you love you've gotten that from Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks and Hangman Page through being the elite, through their work in New Japan, through their work in AEW, where they, they've been able to craft some of, like, the best stories and, like, the most just, like, like in-depth things that we've seen from wrestling storylines and, 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 and programs and feuds. Um, and obviously there's been people saying, like, you're always going to have people online being like, oh, I don't want to watch, I shouldn't have to watch YouTube videos Okay, you you don't have to. Again, as I've stated, you can, if you just watched only AW Dynamite and that's all you got from the Kenny Omega Hangman page feud, guarantee you it would still be a great story um, because they they excelled at it. That was one of the most well built storylines in wrestling um, in in years. So um, so Kenny selling in this match was was absolutely phenomenal. I thought he he did great here. I thought Andrade and Rouge continue to look like a million bucks. They lost here. But neither of them got pinned, um, and I think that these two together could be a very, very big time act overall. Um, Dragon Lee is somebody who always looks great, um, so I don't know if we're gonna get more of him in AEW, but we'll see. Um, but I thought this was a, a phenomenal main event. This is the stuff that you want with your six man tag matches. This is what you want. Like if you look at like this, and you look at what New Japan did with the the their six man belts um, with the team the chaos team uh holding those titles uh tomohiro ishii hiroki goto and yoshihashi uh who who turned the never six man belts into one of the most entertaining belts to be defended um you can do that with this if you if you actually have trios titles and book them well and make them like super high energy tag team matches and not just like you know you're tuning into raw and it's like here's a six-man tag match um yeah, I, I'm excited for the trios t- championships, and it seems like you know Kenny and the Bucks are. I would assume they're winning this. If it's not them, it's House of Black, in my opinion. Um, but I, I'm I was over the moon to see Kenny Omega back, and him teaming with the Young Bucks was great. Uh, and the fact that in this man's return match, we would have one of the most insane spots of the year, where Andrade and Roosh would hoist Omega up onto the barricade, uh, with Andrade then opening the ropes as Roosh held Omega down onto the the top of the the barricade at ringside and (laughs) dragon lee would come out of the ring flying into omega sending himself and omega into the crowd in just an absolute insane 
spot before they would follow up with them throwing Kenny back in and Andrade would um, do his double moonsault. So just a crazy sequence at the end of this. And then um, we, we would get Omega winning here by uh, nailing a brutal V-trigger on Dragon Lee. The fact that I don't know if Dragon Lee was actually knocked out or if this was just really good selling, don't know. Um, and then the V-Trigger, as Kenny and the Bucks would win and progress on to the second round of this tournament. And as this was coming right in at the end, uh, the cameras were focusing on Kenny and the Bucks and basically completely missed this as Roosh and uh, Andrade would turn on Dragon Lee, dropping him with the El Idolo and uh, taking his mask off as we as the show just ended. Um, Tony Khan would tweet out after the show that we will see what happened, uh, on Rampage, so this does seem like there's probably an angle coming from this, um, or, like, something more. I don't know what, but, you know, um, sure. I, I, I like Andrade and Roosh together, and I hope to see more of them, because I really enjoy them as a unit. If we're going crazy here, I really don't know who I would have dethrone Swerve in Our Glory, at this point, so if you want, like, a really strong tag team to put those belts on, Andrade and Roosh wouldn't be the worst idea, in my opinion. Um, I thought they killed it last week against the Lucha Brothers, and I thought they killed it this week in the trios match, so. Uh, all in all, I thought this was one of the strongest episodes of Dynamite, maybe ever. Um, this is gonna be one of the most memorable episodes, that's for sure. Uh, from the opening with Punk and Moxley, their, their brawl later, Danielson versus Garcia 2, uh, the acclaimed reunion with Daddy Ass, um, uh, the, the, and, and the return of Kenny Omega, um, with, the, and this main event as a whole. Um, and obviously, you know, coming out of this, the, everybody's going to be talking about CM Punk, so, um, yeah, very interesting stuff. Uh, all in all, I would say a great episode of AEW Dynamite, and one that I would recommend to pretty much everybody. It's a great two hours of television. And we're heading into next week with a show that is going to probably have a lot of eyes on it, I would assume. I don't know what ratings are going to do for this week. I don't I don't think they're out yet. It's 4.30. I think they come out at 5. Um, but, you know, I, I would assume next week with the added level of stuff going on with, um, with CM Punk that you're going to probably have some more eyes. Oh, okay. Ratings are out. Uh, 957,000. Um, viewers for AW Dynamite, which is down from last week. Um, I think last week was like 970 something. So, um, yeah, but we'll see what happens next week. I would assume that Moxley and Punk, and again, the added drama of that all, there's going to be probably more eyes than normal on the show, but you never know. Um, AW Dynamite's kind of all over the place where sometimes they drop in viewership randomly other times they're up so who knows but regardless this was a fantastic show and at the end of the day as fans i really don't care about the ratings i'm just here to talk about wrestling and i thought this was awesome and i'm looking forward to next week and i'm looking forward to all out so thanks for joining me for this episode of the aw dynamite reviews here for the deep six wrestling podcast i have been pat once again so thank you i hope you enjoyed and um keep your eyes peeled to our podcast feed and to our youtube channel for more content coming over the next couple days with more uh, the, the, our wrap-up for the G1 Climax. Uh, Ryan and Angelo talking about Impact Wrestling and Rob talking about this week's SmackDown. So uh, keep your eyes peeled, and uh, I'll talk to you the next time that I'm on the podcast. But until next time, thanks for listening, and it's been real. Adios.